I'm Dr. Lou Campanosi, president of the Common Sense Campaign Tea Party uh, in South Alabama, and I'm really appreciative of the fact that I can speak to you f for just a few minutes today um, to introduce a really wonderful person who has come down from Yankee Land in Pennsylvania uh, to help us uh, get rid of Common Core. We've been on this mission for the last seven years. We think that we're getting closer to um, our goal. Uh, but uh, this week has been a particularly good week. Um, Dr. Peg Luxick has, has helped us a great deal meeting with the Speaker of the House and uh, talking about HB 558, which is a bill to get rid of Common Core in, in the House. Uh, she has also been here uh, talking to other people um, on Thursday. A pastor's conference was here and she addressed the pastors who are here to talk about Common Core and getting rid of it, why it's necessary for us to do that. And then this afternoon, this is Friday, she's going to be meeting with the State Superintendent of Education to talk to him, um, more than likely about math, which is her specialty, and it's one of his prime objectives is to get math in Alabama back on track. And the best way to do that, in my view, is to get rid of Common Core. So we'll see how all of this goes, but the fact of the matter is we have asked for for the people of Alabama to get involved with this. They have done so. We're asking one more time to go to the mat and make sure that we get as much support to repeal Common Core, either through the state legislature or through the Board of Education. Either one will do as far as we're concerned. Uh, the simplest one would be through the Board of Education. We're going to see how all this works out. But without people like Dr. Luxick, who have, who have continuously fought against Common Core at the national level, and for her to be able to come down here to help us at Alabama is a testament to the kind of people that are against Common Core and are willing to sacrifice themselves and their time and effort to come do these kinds of things, because without this grassroots support, nothing will get done. And it turns really right back to you folks who are watching this to get in touch with your State Board of Education representative and your state legislators. They have to hear from you. And if they do, we may very well be successful in this venture. So without any further ado from me, I want to just turn it over to Dr. Peg Luxick uh, and let her have an opportunity to talk to the people of Alabama directly. Peg, it's yours. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me to come to your state. It's kind of like coming home. I was actually born in Alabama in Huntsville. My father was in the Army. So I'm an Alabama girl, although I didn't get to grow up here. <clears throat> Let me give you a little bit of my own background first. I am an educator with over 35 years of experience in both special education and regular education. I've taught everything from preschool through college in every educational setting you can imagine. I worked, was an advisor to President Reagan's Commission on the Family. I actually worked for the United States Department of Education for a number of years. My job was to review and evaluate education reform initiatives. So I have a long background and history in education. Uh, this isn't my first rodeo. In the 1990s, the uh, go-round was called outcome-based education, and I was one of the leading opponents then. And now it's back in Common Core, where the federal government thinks that they can mandate achievement by executive fiat on our children. In looking at and in examining Common Core, obviously the issue is way too big to do all of it today. So let me just call your attention to a few points that are, are very salient and very important. The first is Common Core is a test-driven system. Your kids take assessments every year and those assessments are used to determine if they move forward or into remediation. They are used in some form for teacher evaluation. So teachers are told that the children must be adjudicated proficient passing in the test in order for the teacher to move forward in their career. And in some states, if they don't pass the test, teachers are losing their jobs and in some cases their licenses. So the, the test is used both to evaluate children and teachers. And you are told that these tests are valid and reliable. Those words mean something. Valid means I test what I say I'm going to test accurately and I don't test anything else. Reliable means every time that test is given, I will get the same results. That's sort of technical, so let me give you an example. Every morning I get on my bathroom scale. I love my bathroom scale. It says I weigh 110. It's my favorite scale on the planet. I am never getting rid of it. 
But then every so often I have to go to the doctors and I get on his scale with those awful weights and it doesn't say 110. My bathroom scale is reliable. It says the same thing every day. It isn't valid. The information isn't accurate. Now, if one day my husband decided to be funny, and while I was standing on the bathroom scale, he stepped up behind me and put his foot on the scale, all of a sudden it wouldn't say 110. That isn't a measurement of my weight. That's a measurement of his foot. So it's not valid because it's testing something else that I didn't think it was testing. Now, how does that apply to the tests that are given in your state, these state assessments that we use to evaluate children and teachers? When the children come into that classroom, you have no idea what that child is bringing to the testing situation. You don't know if they had breakfast. You don't know if they got a good night's sleep. You don't know if they're in the first day of a cold. You know the day where you don't really think of yourself as being sick, but you feel like you're walking through mental mud because everything is moving more slowly. You don't know if their dog died last night or their family's in the middle of a divorce. So when you look at that score, is that a math score? Or did you just test the fact that that child's dog died the night before? In New York, I was giving this presentation in a large audience and a teacher in the back of the room stood up. She teaches in the poorest district in the state of New York. And she told a story about her, one of her little girls who's, who watched her mother shot on the front porch of their home in a drive-by shooting and three weeks later she had to take a state assessment. And the teacher said, this child has not spoken in four months. Do you think that assessment score really measured math? Of course it didn't. It measured trauma. Well, in any given testing population as big as a state, for about 10% of the children, that measurement is measuring something other than academics, which means the number is meaningless. However, as the socioeconomic level of the children being tested goes down, that extraneous factor piece goes up because children who live in poverty are more likely to have not good nutrition, not good rest, upheaval at home, and undiagnosed illness, some extraneous factor. In fact, the state of New York plotted the test results with the socioeconomic levels of the districts and they got a straight line that as the economic level goes down, the achievement went, as the achievement went down too. So these tests, measure not academics, they measure poverty, and then they punish children for being poor. Who in their right mind thought this system was a good idea? The second problem deals with the, the curriculum structure inside Common Core itself. The writers of Common Core use the word rigorous. As a matter of fact, you never hear about the Common Core standards without them attaching the word rigorous to it. That's a Madison Avenue tactic. Kind of like when you hear about farmer's insurance, everybody's mind says bump, ba bump, 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 because it's a marketing technique. So they use it all the time, so you'll think the standards are rigorous without actually examining the words. Are they? Are they more rigorous? Well, let's look at math, and then we'll take a brief look at, at literature. The writers of the Common Core Standards, there were 29 of them, William McCallum was one of the gentlemen in charge of the math standards. And while the standards were being written, he attended the National Conference of Teachers of Math Education in America. And the teachers were looking at a draft and having heart failure, saying, these are nuts, what are you doing? And he told them, oh, don't, don't worry, these standards won't be too high, especially in comparison to countries where math education excels. Trevor Packer, who is the executive vice president of the college board, addressed the American Association of School Superintendents shortly after the standards were written. And he said college, the Common Core Standards slows the math progression down and that calculus isn't even part of the thread. Now they slow it down by about two years. And so that takes calculus out of the thread. The National Center for Education and the Economy, which is a federal think tank that's been involved in the development and implementation of these standards, both at the federal level and then in many states in a consultant uh, area, actually wrote a document in 2013 called, What Does It Mean to Be College and Work Ready? And their document said, Algebra 1 by the end of your sophomore year in high school. Because they said, 95% of the careers out there don't need math above Algebra 2, so it's a waste to teach it if you don't need it for your job. 
And since most community colleges, the document continued, only require Algebra 1 to begin community college, why would we teach anything beyond that? Well, if you teach Algebra 1 at the end of your sophomore year in high school, that puts geometry in 11th grade and Algebra 2 in 12th grade. In Pennsylvania, I debated the Pennsylvania Secretary of Education, and in the course of the debate, my opponents told me, oh, Peg, I don't know why you're having a problem. They'll still be AP Algebra 2. And I stopped the debate and said, right now, Algebra 2 is a 10th grade subject. The AP course is calculus. So it's an open recognition that we've slowed math down by those two years. Now, is that a good idea? Because if it's a good idea, why would we worry about it? I told you I worked for the U.S. Department of Education. The U.S. Department of Education actually does study education issues. And in 1999, they published a study called Answers in the Toolbox, and what they were looking at is what leads to success in college. And what they found was that if children get past Algebra II in high school, they more than double their odds of successfully completing a four-year college degree. That study became part of a meta-analysis that was done by, of all places, Auburn University. And Auburn looked at 25 years worth of data of what looks, what would contribute to success in college. And what they found was that if children get to calculus in high school, they are 28 times. I did not say 28%. I said 28 times. That's 2,800%. More likely, not just to finish college, but to be a high achiever. And it, that number, that um, result held up regardless of the race, the socioeconomic status of the children, the kind of high school that they went to, or the major that they took. Because the skills of higher math translate they train your mind to take a big problem and break it down, to persevere, to think in a straight line, to be able to plan out the steps that you want to take. And all of those skills serve our children well. Now, does that mean every child should take calculus? Of course not. Does that mean every child should go to college? No. But it does mean that when we are setting education policy, we should establish educational policy that is designed to give the greatest number of children the greatest opportunity to succeed in life. And a pathway to calculus is that option. How is it that the Department of Education does not know in 2017 something that they did know in 1999? It leads a reasonable person to lift both eyebrows. Now let's look at the literature section, because Common Core is math and, and literature. In looking at the literature, there's hundreds and hundreds of standards. The thing that stands out is that the children don't read um, actual literature. It moves to nonfiction writing. But I wanted to know, how do these pieces fit together in an actual classroom? So I went out and I bought a 12th grade literature book published by Pearson. I picked Pearson because they are the largest single publisher of Common Core materials, and they are hired by many of the states to design, administer, and score the Common Core tests. So their 12th grade literature book, um, I opened it. Now remember, these are 17-year-old children. And on the very first page of the children's book, the first thing they tell the children is that every selection in the book is available in audio format. So the first thing we tell 17-year-old children in a book that's supposed to increase literacy is that you don't have to read the book. The second thing that they tell them is that there's also an audio cliff notes version of the book. Now, you and I went to school and we, if we're honest, we used cliff notes when we thought we could get away with it. And Good teachers designed um, activities that made it so that you couldn't finish the activity with just the cliff notes. Because I actually wanted you to read Shakespeare or Chaucer or Dickens, not just somebody else's summary of it. But the publishers of this book tell the children, no, you don't, you don't have to read the book. You can listen to the book. And if that's really too much time, you can listen to a summary. How is a book that begins by telling them that they don't have to read going to increase literacy? It was funny, I was in Tennessee and a teacher said, well, I mean, the teacher would certainly encourage them. And I looked at her and said, so you've never taught 17 year olds, have you? And the whole room kind of laughed because anybody who's experienced a 17 year old knows if you tell them a way around the work, they're going to find it because they're 17. 
The book goes on, and in the book, they talk about um, Chaucer. And they define the Chaucer stories as a frame, which is true. A frame, uh, literary construction, is a story within a story. So the frame is the pilgrims are all going on this journey, and then the pictures inside are the separate stories that each of the pilgrims tell. So think of a frame and a picture. But the book says, well, it's kind of like the old television show. It was a Christmas special about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer where the snowman tells the story. And I looked at that and thought, no, that's not a frame. That's a flashback. The snowman says, this happened before. The snowman doesn't have a story. There's no frame around the picture. So this 12th grade literature book doesn't get its literary constructions correct. The second thing the book does, and you kind of have to read through the whole book to pick it up, talks about, and we'll, we'll continue to use Chaucer, that in that time in England, they didn't teach women to read. That's true. They also didn't teach the men because the printing press hadn't been invented yet, so there weren't any books for anybody to be able to read. So the statement that they didn't teach women to read is true, but it's what I call a true lie lying with true words, because they left out the part that the men weren't taught to read, which made it look like the women were being discriminated against. Now, maybe they were and maybe they weren't in that time period, but the construct in the book did not accurately present the situation to the children. The book has a series on um, how 19th century literature is dealt with in 21st century media. And so they used uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as the example. So the first thing the children are given in the book is Mary Shelley's essay on how and why she wrote Frankenstein. And then they're given an essay by the editor of the book about how she felt when she read Frankenstein. And then they read a Saturday Night Live skit about Frankenstein. Did you notice what they didn't read? They didn't read Frankenstein. They didn't read a single word of the book, not a chapter, not a paragraph, not a sentence, not a letter. How do you compare the treatment of two of the same topic in two genres if you don't read one of the genres? And yet our kids didn't get any piece of Frankenstein to read. This is by any definition, poor pedagogy. Pedagogy is the science of education. It is a poorly constructed, poorly written book that is passing for 12th grade literature inside a Common Core curriculum by the largest publishing house of Common Core materials in the country. When the quality of the materials is that poor, parents should have serious concerns. So what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is make sure you protect your own children. If your children are in a public school, take them out tomorrow. Make sure your children get the education that they need. The second thing you do is you get in there and you fight like mad for the health and future of the public schools in America. Because American public schools are unique in the world. They were the schools that were based on the premise that your past did not have to determine your future. They were the schools that allowed a poor kid in the slums of Detroit to become the leading pediatric neurosurgeon in the world. His name was Dr. Ben Carson. He came from America's public schools. And they and the children within them are under attack. That means you need to support every initiative politically that takes this onus off of the schools. You need to return control, control of Alabama schools to the state of Alabama, where people who've actually met the children in your state can determine the educational progress and futures of those children. No bureaucrat in Washington knows your child better than you do. It's time that you protect the children in this state. Make sure every political candidate is asked at every meeting where do you stand on Common Core? And what are you going to do to get rid of it? Don't allow them to just say, oh, I'm against it. Make them give you the specifics of what steps they're going to take to stop it. That onus is on us. I was an advisor to President Reagan. President Reagan used to say that freedom isn't passed down through our bloodstream. We, every generation, has to stand up to defend it and to protect it. And we must pass it on and teach it to our children. 
Well, we are the generation right now entrusted with protecting that freedom and ensuring that we can pass it on to our children. I came here to your state, and in some ways my state, to give you the information and to beg you to step up to the plate because the children of America today are depending on us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peg. Yeah. That's yeah. just absolutely I wonderful. have a question, if I may, Dr. Peg, since we've got you here. Uh, what you were talking about in regard to our military uh, bases, mm -hmm. uh, for the businessman, for the uh, mayor, the leaders that are there and doesn't really know about this Common Core, maybe they got a bit just now, I know their concern is running their communities. What would you like to say to them? Right now, Alabama ranks 51st out of 50 states, which is really quite a feat. <laughs> um, when you look at how the business community operates, and we have a president right now who is committed to rebuilding America's economy, and the new jobs report is phenomenal. Jobs are up. There were over 211,000 new jobs created just last month, and factory owners across this country, uh, people are being willing to invest in America again. They are, instead of moving jobs offshore, they're building plants, they're hiring workers. So that means that every state is potentially in a position to increase the economy. But when the military is looking for where they put bases, when businessmen are looking for where they put their businesses, they look at the quality of life in the place where they're looking to, to build that business, especially for businesses that are white collar businesses with workers that have um, high skill levels and therefore high salaries. Those are also people who are totally able to move from place to place and they can uh, shop the jobs and therefore the communities. Well, one of the things that the military and that business community looks at is your schools, because those folks want their children to go to schools that are high achieving, high quality. Right now, you are bottom of the barrel. Well, if you want to attract businesses, if you want to keep the military bases that you have and encourage the military to expand them, you want your schools to be top of the line, not bottom of the line, because that will work against people coming here, businesses coming here to invest in your state because the, they won't be able to attract the workers that they need. That's an economic issue. Those workers in high skilled white collar jobs, yeah, they pay higher levels of income tax. They have more discretionary income, so they buy more things that stimulate your economy and pays more sales tax. Education is as much an economic issue as it is a child issue, but not in the way that many of the Common Core uh, proponents are telling us our children are not human capital but good schools build good communities and so the folks in Alabama to step up to the plate and demand that the educational community restore to them the quality of education that you had here before Common Core is a fight worth having. If I could <clears throat> um, again thank you so much for You're being welcome. here and I think that uh, your analysis of, of the problems and the solutions, I think, are just right on. Um, I'd like to in, invite uh, two other people to come speak for just a second because the fact of the matter is, is that Alabama has a, a, a large group of committed grassroots leaders who have been fighting this for a long time. And I think it's, it would be worthwhile for everyone to meet those folks and hear from them and perhaps it will inspire you to get yourself involved with, with this effort. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce you to is Ms. Uni Smith. Uh, Uni's been you know, the, the head of Eagle Forum, uh, a, major, a major institution in Alabama, working hard on a whole spectrum of, of, of issues. Um, but this has been you know, um, one of her leading issues, and I think uh, it would be um, worthwhile for everyone to hear from you, Uni. It's all up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lou. Thank you absolutely, Peg. That was a wonderful explanation of the situation from someone who obviously has a depth of understanding and expertise. And uh, we just cannot thank you enough for coming here and explaining, explaining, illustrating to us the problem in both math and English language arts. We, um, Eagle Forum, I am the state president of Eagle Forum. Currently, I'm serving as the national president of Eagle Forum. <clears throat> Excuse me. Education, academic excellence in education has been uh, on the forefront uh, 
for us for years and years and years. And in 2011, when we saw Common Core, we recognized, as you said, that it was just a rerun, only worse, of lots of the failed um, social engineering uh, operations that were being imposed on education. Um, at the, in 2011, Alabama, according to the NAEP scores on math and English language arts, was in the middle. We were 26th and rising. We were, we were uh, trending upward. And then just four years later, we did such a good job of implementing Common Core that we were, as you said, dead last in those two areas. Now, how anyone in our state cannot connect that testing result, and it was not just NAEP, it was ACT as well, to Common Core is, is hard for me to understand. Um, except that it is hard for anybody to admit that they were wrong. Uh, but, you know, we just need to, as a state, pull together and do what is best for these children. Um, give, as you said, the kind of education on which this country was built and has prospered that enables every child to achieve, no matter where he or she begins. Um, this is a book by Joy Pullman that's just out. She's with Heart Heartland Institute and the Federalist uh, Institute as well. She uh, has been in Alabama speaking. It's called The Education Invasion, How Common Core Fights Parents for Control of American Kids. That's another aspect of it. It's very, very important. Um, we want to see parents at, through local control of education, determining what they understand is best for their own children. Um, so I would just encourage everybody who's listening to get in touch with their legislators and their state board of education and say, stop, stop Common Core in any semblance of it. Uh, support these two bills, which um, may not be likely to pass in this legislative session, but they still deserve support now. And speak as well to your state board of education member and to the state superintendent of education. We have a superintendent of education who came to us from Massachusetts, which was the highest achieving state in the nation. He knows how to, to uh, frame uh, standards and, and build a system that can educate at well academically, which is the main purpose of education. Um, speak to all these elected representatives and, and tell them now we must do better for our kids in the state of Alabama. So thank you again, thank you. Dr. Lucy. Yeah. Thank you, Uni. Um, you know, the, the, this is such a difficult mm -hmm. um, problem to deal with because it, it affects so many different people and it has harmed so many people. And I think that, you know, there's an abstract quality to it because it basically says it's school. We and you know the schools go through their changes and this is just another change. And I think that if, if we get hooked into that kind of thinking, I think we're going to really find that this is a bigger disaster than what we have even identified it to be right now. And I think that questions about the, the, what these people are trying to teach, what they're doing with data analysis and data, the aggregation of data for these kids, and setting them on a, on a trend essentially to become a, the same version of a European model which says you're in X grade and you're going to be going in this direction and these other folks are going to go to college and higher education. I mean, I think it's totally un-American. And another person that I would like you to, to meet and hear from is one of those individuals who has done so much to get our legislators thinking about doing the right thing. And not only about Common Core, but in terms of <laughs> every type of, edu of, of uh, legislation, every piece of legislation that comes up. Mrs. Ann Eubank, who is 
part of the Rainy Day Patriots and the head of the, the Rainy Day Patriots watchdog has been on this. And Anne is an individual that you need to hear from because she can give you the types of insights about how to get yourself organized to do the kinds of things that, that Uni and Peg have talked about. Miss Eubank. Yeah, we're Louis. Come on over here. I will get up. Thank you. Have a seat. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ann Eubank, and I am the chair of the Alabama Legislative Watchdogs. It's an offshoot of the Rainy Day Patriots Tea Party, which is one of the first 10 tea parties in America. Uh, what we do is we go to the legislature when they're in session every year. We are there on committee days and on days when they're on the floor. And in those committees, we listen to the bills that have been put forth by our legislators. Common Core has so many tentacles in so many different directions that they put pieces of bills that will implement things into law that Common Core wants done to our children, such as the data collection bill. Um, the businesses here, the Workforce Development Council, want the data collection. And it started out as the state longitudinal data system that would collect uh, information from the students in the schools about their familial demographics and store it in one place and they continue to tell us that um, it's here and it's not going anywhere. Well, that's a true lie. Again, Dr. Pegg has told us about the true lies. Yes, it's here. Yes, it's stored here. But the federal government has the right to collect that information at any time it wishes. We don't have to give it to them. The latest bill that's come up is the data collection bill that takes every department in the state of Alabama who collects information on children, families, veterans, uh, workers, anybody who works or lives in Alabama has information collected on them. And they want to take every bit of that information from the Department of Ed, Department of Human Services, De Veterans Department, Labor Department, and put it all in one place in the Labor Department, which sounds like, okay, Alabama's going to have all this information in one place. That's a good thing. Problem with that is that the Alabama Labor Department shares this information with the United States Labor De Department of Labor, which shares this information with every other federal department. And that information will be collected from birth, to right now they say several years into workforce, but we know the end goal is birth to death, cradle to grave. You will have your information in, all over the United States and anybody who wants to access it, all they have to do is fill out a form and say, um, I need that information and I'll be careful with it. I'm not sure that people realize that that's what the data bill does. Uh, another bill we're looking at is the daycare bill. There's a bill in the legislature right now who, that wants to take all daycares and put it under DHR, which is the Department of, of Human Resources, uh, including church daycares, where you have to meet the government regulations and the government has the right to tell you what you can and cannot do in a church daycare center. Well, if you say, well, it's for the children, it's for the safety of the children, that's fine, but when the government can tell a church daycare center that you can't say the word God, that's not fine. And had we not mobilized, had the watchdogs not mobilized, that bill would have passed in that form. It comes up next week, and my suggestion is, is that you call your legislators and tell them you don't want that kind of bill. So those are the kinds of things that the watchdogs has done. Every time there's a bill that comes up about charter schools, we mobilize. 
there's absolutely nothing wrong with charter schools, but in the state of Alabama, we have one individual who takes $5 million from the scholarship grant organizations and, and they are private. That money is education tax dollars. So what could a school do with $5 million? We have, a school, we have schools in Winston County who don't even have enough books in one classroom so that every child in the classroom can have a book. They can't take them home simply because they don't have any to even use in the classroom. But $5 million a year is going to a private individual. That's the reason I'm against charter schools in Alabama. They changed that. School choice sounds great. Parents should have a choice of where their school, where they go to school. The federal government has mandated that you go to the school that's in your area, your zip code. All you have to do is change that. You can go to any school you want in any area you want. And that's school choice. It doesn't take millions of dollars being paid out to give us school choice. But those are the kinds of things that Watchdog does. And I would love for every person out there listening to join us when the legislature goes into session. Come down on Wednesdays. Give me a call. You can find me, Alabama Legislative Watchdogs, on Facebook. And let me know you're going to be there. And I'll give you a yellow watchdog button because if you walk into the legislature, the state house, and you have on a yellow button, they know who you are. So, but thank Dr. Peg for being here because she is such a fountain of information that has just blown me away. I've spent seven years dealing with this. But she makes me feel like I am just a newbie. I'm going to hang out with her more. But thank you, Dr. Pig. Thank you, Ann. You know, once again, the, the, the fact that individuals like Ann and Uni are doing the work they're doing is indicative of what the Founding Fathers expected from all of us in terms of our civic duty. Um, it's not sufficient to have, you know, the press which is the fake news nowadays. Uh, we don't have a press that's watching these people for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, we need citizens involved with us. And I think after this, this little session is over here, um, Diana Cruz will provide us with the information that you need to how to get into, in touch with all of these various conservative Tea Party groups that actually do the work that's necessary to watch what's going on uh, here in, in Alabama. Um, unfortunately, we can't do everything uh, that we'd like to do watching what goes on in D.C., but uh, you know, maybe someone will drain the swamp up there. We'll see. But we're trying to drain it here, and it is a very difficult job because the connections between business and money and politics is such that it is very difficult to break through it. And the fact is that that's one of the big reasons we have not been able to get rid of Common Core because lots of people got lots of money to provide for their little, you know, uh, campaigns to get reelected. And the fact is, is that um, we don't operate on the same level in terms of being able to provide money to do this and do that. We operate because people like you are willing to get involved, and this is one of the biggest issues that, that is facing us today because everything starts in school and it carries through with life. And if we don't have a firm basis for our children right at the beginning, what do you expect is going to happen? And uh, so I would, I would urge all of you to, to think carefully about what, has been, what you've heard today and make that commitment, particularly in the next two weeks while the session is, is going on here. Now is the time for these folks to hear from you, and if you do that, then we can have the outcome that we think is absolutely critical for the future of your children. Thank you very much, and thank all of you all who are here today. Diana, I need to put one more look. Have you got any? You don't have any? <laughs>